following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Welcome. Today, we will proceed with our examination of the Arcana. Today's lecture is the Arcanum 11, which is known by varying names such as strength, persuasion. The image for this Arcana Arcanum shows us a woman who stands with great serenity before a lion. The lion has its mouth open, and she reaches forward and closes his mouth with her bare hands. The Arcanum 11, at first glance, appears to contain a rather straightforward symbolism. But for the Gnostic student who investigates mythology, or the religious symbolism contained in all the world's great religions, we find that this arcanum refers to a vast, extensive, and deeply interconnected symbolism. The lion is an ancient and ubiquitous religious symbol. We find the symbol of the lion in all the ancient mythologies and religions. It may be nearly as omnipresent as the serpent itself. In all of the American traditions, the Maya, the Aztec, the lion, or the great cat, plays a central role also in the ancient mysteries of Egypt. We find the lion is one of the oldest symbols. The ancient god of Amun-Ra, the solar father of the Egyptian mysteries, is often displayed as a lion. Amun-Ra, the solar father in these Egyptian mysteries, is the progenitor of the family of gods. The Gnostic student does not make the mistake of attributing to these symbolic figures 
the kind of literal and superficial meanings that are often ascribed to these gods by archaeologists, by school children. The gods of ancient Egypt are symbols of Kabbalah. That is, they represent a profound scientific and mathematical mystery. Amun-Ra, as that ancient solar divinity, the father of the gods, is the sun god, or in other words, the cosmic Christ. From himself, he emanates or manifests a pair of twin gods. These twin gods are Shu and Tefnut. Shu, S H U, is a masculine solar divinity. Shu, the word Shu from the ancient Egyptian, refers to dryness, emptiness, space. Shu is often represented as a lion in the same manner as his father. We see in this a a close similarity to the Greek mysteries, which we've discussed in previous lectures. Shu bears a striking similarity to Apollo, who is also a twin god. Shu's sister consort is named Tefnut. Tefnut in the ancient Egyptian refers to moisture. So we see in Shu and Tefnut twin lion gods because Tefnut is also represented as a lion, a lioness. And in many of her images, she has the body of a human and the head of a lion. Tefnut is related to the moon. Shu is related to the sun. These twin lion gods, the children of Amun-Ra, represent an essential duality, which, of course, in Kabbalah, we find represented in Da'at, Shiva Shakti. Interestingly, if you go deeper into the Egyptian symbolism, you discover that Shu and Tefnut, brother and sister, husband and wife, also have children. Their children are Geb, the god of the earth, and Nut, the goddess of the sky. So we see an unfolding of pairs, which is very deep in its Kabbalistic symbolism, related to the worlds of Atsut and Bria. But that's another lecture. The point here is, when we examine Shu and Tefnut, we see a duality. We see two columns male and female, man and woman. This is the Arcanum 11, which presents, of course, two number ones side by side. These two are the two columns of the temple. This mysterious basis for that sephira, that 
which is that tree of knowledge. The two columns stand some space apart, which provides them the strength to uphold the edifice of the temple. These two columns are Jaquin and Boaz. Positive and negative. Projective and receptive. Black and white. Yin and yang. Male and female. Sun and moon. When we look deeper into the symbols of these two Egyptian Kabbalistic mysteries. We find that Shu as the masculine solar divinity has a very strong relationship with serpents. Shu is attributed power over serpents. And Shu is also known to guide the dead to the ladder of heaven. In previous lectures, we've discussed the ladder. The ladder is our very spinal column upon which our consciousness can ascend or descend to ascend into the heavenly realms by becoming more pure or to descend into the abyss by becoming more identified with animal desire. Shu, as the lion god, embodies in himself this essential duality of the serpent and the lion. As we know in Gnostic symbolism and in all the symbolism of the world religions, the serpent always has a dual aspect. There's the healing serpent and the destructive serpent. There's the positive, upward-driving serpent of Devi Kundalini. And there's the descending, destructive serpent of Kalima, or the Kundabuffer. Shu has the power over these serpents. And according to how we work with our own serpent power, We walk upon the ladder of our own spinal column. All of this is under the regency of Shu, as a solar divinity, as an aspect of our own inner consciousness. That is, the lion power within us is the power of the solar gods, which descends through our psyche. It's the power of the kings, And that power is polarized according to our will. If our will is to be a slave of that lion power or the animal instinct, then we drive the serpent downwards. Yet if we conquer that lion in the manner of the woman in the card, then we rise upon the ladder. Tefnut, the sister and consort of Shu, has as her attributes gentle rain and a soft wind. What's interesting about Chef Tefnut is that she's also said to give the power of the breath to the deceased. Do you get that? Do you remember in previous lectures we've discussed Neshima, which is the breath of God, which in the Jewish or Hebrew symbolism, in Kabbalistic symbolism, is our divine soul, Geberah. And from that breath we receive the information, wisdom, intuition, inspiration from our own being. So Tefnut, the sister of Shu, is that breath, that divine feminine consciousness, which delivers that gentle 
wind and rain. This is persuasion. This is the power of the consciousness to conquer the animal nature. Tefnut, the Egyptian goddess, symbolizes the way in which we receive the inspiration, the force, the energy of the gods, of our own being, our own inner self, our own spirit, and transform those forces through the inspiration that we receive through our own neshima, the breath. But Tefnut gives that breath to the dead. To the dead. This does not mean simply when we've died physically. The Egyptian book of the dead and all the mysterious religious funerary texts refer not to the physically dead, although they became known as that. They refer to the psychologically dead. In other words, those who've passed through the decapitation of John the Baptist. Those who have died as an ego. So in this card, we're reminded of Tefnut when we observe this woman who with great gentleness closes the mouth of the lion. She symbolizes that Olympic serenity. Olympic referring to Olympic, the the, uh, domain of the gods, Olympus, the realm of the gods. Olympic serenity means a kind of serenity that comes from power, the power of the gods. It is a kind of confidence, a strength, which is really the meaning of this card, the meaning of this image, persuasion, strength. Interestingly, the number 11 is related to the Hebrew character Kaf. Kaf is in the form or represented by a hand in the attitude of grasping. Some Kabbalists say that Kaf has the attribute or has the characteristic of force. But what kind of force does Kaf embody? Obviously, Arcanum 11 is strength, persuasion. This force is the force of love. It's the force of intuition, of inspiration, which comes through Neshima, through that breath, the influence of the divine consciousness, the force with which the woman in the card closes the mouth of the lion or animal desire. Naturally, through the mouth, the lion feeds itself. To close the mouth of the lion represents the need, the necessity for the initiate, the one who wants to ascend up the ladder of heaven, to close the mouth of the lion, the hand in the attitude of grasping, kaf, force, but the force of persuasion, not violence. Here we see another interesting duality. There are many energies in the universe. Many ways to manifest our will. The animal instinct is a very forceful energy. 
When we analyze the symbol of the lion, we see an extensive and very deep and rich history. But if we look simply at the astrological significance, and we study Leo, we see that Leo is that influence, the stellar influence, which rules over our heart and our spine. This is profoundly significant. In the Egyptian mysteries, the heart was considered the brain. The heart was considered the place from which we think and decide and choose. And this, of course, is because the ancient Egyptians understood that the Adam Nus, that influence of the Christ, resides within the heart. The Tibetans often describe the necessity to invert the positions of our heart and brain. To learn to think with the heart and feel with the mind. This is how we establish a kind of balance in our psyche. Leo, this lion-like or forceful influence, rules the heart and the spine. In Kabbalistic Gnostic psychology, we understand that the spine is related to our third brain, the motor instinctive sexual brain. We have the motor brain at the top of the spine, the instinctive brain or center at the base of the spine, and the sexual center also at the lower portion of the spine. But these three aspects we consider as one brain. They're very instinctive, very powerful. Leo influences us, the force of the lion. In other words, our own animal nature works very strong, in a very strong way, through our motor instinctive sexual brain. This is self evident. When you observe yourself, you analyze yourself, you see many behaviors that arise before you can even think about it, before you can even feel something, behaviors arise without your conscious ability to control it or influence it. This is the force of the lion in us, the animal nature. The lion as a negative or inverted influence. This is animal passion without restraint. An easy example of this is to see how our own animal nature seeking to feed itself through its mouth manipulates us through our spinal column, through our motor instinctive sexual brain, to look with lust at other people instantaneously. In fact, we know, we sense, when there's a lustful image, even when we've not seen it with our eyes. And you'll observe this in yourself, when all of a sudden you find yourself turning to look at another person that you didn't even know was there, with your physical eyes, but your instinct knew it. And you look to them with lust. This is the lion out of control. This is the lion controlling us. This is our own consciousness enslaved by animal nature. And this is what has to change. Leo also influences the heart. And we see that the animal passions, our own inner lion, works very much in our blood. Works very much in the negative emotions, the desires in our heart. Many times, we feel that we're in love. We feel strong emotion, strong connection, strong attachment in the heart. Not realizing that it is actually lust, masquerading itself in the heart. Animal passion 
masquerading itself in the heart. This is very difficult to distinguish. Very difficult to resolve. Because it feels real. This is why we need the influence of the positive forces of Leo. The positive forces of our own inner lion. Which is the solar divinities. Our own being. Neshema. This is acquired through meditation. This is acquired through transmutation. To take and harness the power of the serpent. Tefnut, the goddess, the twin lion god, is also represented with a serpent on her forehead. And that's one of her forms. If you see any Egyptian image of a pharaoh or a god or a goddess with a serpent on their forehead, that is Tefnut. That's how she's represented. In her human form, she's also represented with a disc and horns. A solar disc and horns because she is a solar divinity. Those horns also have profound significance. Of course, the crown of the pharaohs, the crown that Tefnut wears with the horns, is really what Kaf means. Kaf represents a crown, this character, the Hebrew character. It's also the first letter of the word Keter, which means crown. The Arcanum 11 encodes in itself the force that we need to manage to conquer our animal nature. When we accomplish that, we receive the crown. The crown of gold. That is Keter. And if you recall, Keter has a relationship with all the first ten arcana. Keter is mentioned throughout. But specifically with Arcanum 10, which is the character Yod, and Arcanum 1, which is the character Aleph. The 1, of course, if you take two of those, you have Arcanum 11, which is what we're studying now. Each of those is a one. Each of those is a man and a woman. Two katers. And it's in this relationship, the harmony, the harmony of the man and the woman, that the Arcanum 11 is elaborated. In this Arcanum, we see a profound mystery of alchemy. In the relationship between man and woman is the power to conquer our animal nature. This is the power to balance the forms of duality, the forms of dualism. And it's a power that's acquired through the heart, through the spine, through Leo. All the ancient kings throughout the world sit upon thrones of gold. Much of the time, the thrones themselves have the bodies of animals, usually lions. You can find archaeological evidence from Sumeria, from Egypt, from the east, from the west. Thrones of gold built upon the forms of lions. This is no accident. This is not circumstance or coincidence. This represents that the king, the one who's conquered, the one who has overcome, does so by standing upon the gold, 
by sitting upon the gold of the lion. At the base of this card, we see a perfect square, which is the cubic stone. And this stone rests in the waters, which of course relates to Da'at, the sexual waters. That cubic stone has to be formed, has to be molded, has to be perfected through the works of alchemy. And as you know, alchemy is the tradition, the science, to transform lead or a base metal, which is very impure and heavy, into gold, which is perfect. That symbolizes the need to transform our own sexual waters, which are full of impurities, into pure waters, into golden waters. And this is accomplished by man and woman working in harmony with cooperation. Within this cube, we see a falcon standing upon the back of a serpent. This is Heru from the Egyptian symbolism. Heru is the ancient name of Horus, who, of course, is the son of Isis and Osiris. What's represented here is that our own individualized, personal, cosmic Christ has to inhabit our cubic stone. And God, or the Christ, can only save those who have perfected themselves with his help. This is why Jesus in the gospel said, Be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. No one can enter the hev- into the kingdom of heaven except through the Christ. And the Christ does not accept adulterers, fornicators, murderers, liars, which all of us are. It becomes necessary for us to examine the lead of our personality, to purify it, to be born again. To be born again is not a theory or a belief. To be born requires sexual cooperation. All of us have been born because of the cooperation of our parents. In the same manner, the soul is born. If we consider life as a series of octaves, we see this physical realm. And we have a certain range of perception. This is like a note on a keyboard. What we see is one note. What we hear is one note. But what about all the other notes? We have certain tools that can measure some of them. The process of awakening the consciousness is the process of extracting from impurity the pure consciousness. And when that consciousness is freed, it has the capacity to perceive the other notes on the keyboard. This is not theoretical. The evidence for it is right before our eyes in all of the symbols of all the world's religions who all in their essence agree. The way to acquire perception of heaven is through purity of heart, purity of thought, purity of action. So long as impurity corrupts our soul, we remain in that level, trapped in that level of impurity. And thus our perception is clouded. To move our rate of vibration, to move up the notes of that ladder, requires that we extract ourselves from the lower levels of our own mind. 
to change our level of being, we have to abandon all of the activities of the lower level of being. This is not an abandonment in the sense of making a vow, of saying, I will stop doing this bad thing. This is fine as a start. But we need a force, a power, a strength of persuasion. We need that Olympic serenity. The power to accomplish something without even the process of thought. The ability to behave spontaneously in the right way. Not merely because we intend it. This is a subtle distinction. We may intend to do well, but if the ego still resides in our heart, it still corrupts our action. We may intend to be loving, but if the ego of anger resides in our heart, our hate will still be there and still creating an influence. The real form of persuasion is a spontaneous and perfect love. Without artifice. Meaning, without any kind of falseness. Without false appearance. Without trying to be that way. It just is. And that force, which is this positive force of the Arcanum 11, only arises because of causes and conditions. It doesn't arise because of intention. In other words, if the ego is there, existing, it does modify our actions. It does modify our thoughts and feelings, even if we don't see it. In the same way, there are many influences that affect what we do, even if we don't see them, even if we aren't aware of them. Through the process of alchemy, through the little by little closing the mouth of the lion, we extract the pure consciousness. And every spark of that consciousness that's extracted gives us more spontaneous powers of love. More ability to close the mouth of the lion further. This is a work of patience. This is not something that's accomplished with violence. Violence has to be understood. Animal nature is violent. And by violent, we mean forceful. When we look at the lion, we see it has tremendous power. And we admire that. And this is part of the reason the lion has played such a central role in religion and mythology. But this lion force can be either positive or negative, as we see in the symbol of the lion. In the negative form, the force of the lion can become fanatical, can become skeptical. Many interpret a very forceful, very adamant attitude as good, but it is not. The mind that we have, that animal power, can become fanatic, which is a form of violence. To be fanatic is to be enslaved by one's own fear and pride related to a certain belief or theory. To be a skeptic is to be enslaved by one's fear and pride 
but the opposite polarity of the fanatic. There's still a form of violence in the mental plane. To embody the form of persuasion, the positive force, is to have self-reliance, to have faith, faith born of experience. This is real faith. And this form of faith does not need to convince anyone. It also respects the beliefs of everyone. This is real persuasion. This is real love. Persuasion, or this force embodied by kaf, is neither skeptic or fanatic. It is a form of serenity. Serenity can only be born through comprehension. So you see the emphasis in this arcanum? It's a combination. It's deeply psychological. Through transmutation of our forces, through comprehension of our forces, we conquer that animal, forceful nature. which can become forceful in the mind and the heart and in action. The Buddha himself has long been called the lion of the Shakya. Shakya is his clan that he came from. And if you investigate Buddhist symbolism, you'll see that most of the time the throne of the Buddha is made of a lion sometimes eight lions. We also see Shiva, closely related to the lion. We also see Paldan Lamo. Paldan Lamo is a Tibetan form of an Indian goddess. Paldan Lamo is represented in a very wrathful aspect, ferocious. Some would say demonic, but it's not that. Paldan Lamo is the protector of the Dharma. She appears wrathful because she embodies the force of the lion in order to conquer the ego, to conquer deception. But she's a form of compassion. We see the same thing in the symbol of Durga in the Hindu pantheon. Durga is also, also a wrathful goddess. Durga rides a lion. And she has in her hand a serpent. And she battles against the demon. The demon transforms himself into a lion. So here we have the lion in its many aspects. Durga as that feminine, wrathful force of Maha Kundalini, Devi Kundalini, with the serpent. She's empowered in us through the process of alchemy, through the process of transmutation. She's fed by our own sexual forces. It's only in this way, with that energy, that we transmute, that we transform, that we purify, with her help, that she has the force of kap, persuasion, which is the force of the Divine Mother to conquer the ego, the demon, who transforms himself into a lion in order to inflame our blood in order to manipulate us through the motor instinctive sexual center, through the heart, through the mind. There's a battle. A battle of forces, a battle of wills, inside of us, in our own psyche. Battles are not fun. Battles are not easy. Battles are also not predictable. To 
To be a warrior, you have to go through a lot of training. You have to learn basic exercises. You have to train your body, your mind, and your heart. In the work to self-realize, you also pass through periods of training. Studying this type of information is how you train yourself in the beginning. You're gathering the data, the knowledge, the structures. But you also have to train yourself in practical terms. You have to perform the exercises. To be content with reading books, studying the theory, will leave one helpless on the battlefield if you have not performed the training exercises themselves. Those training exercises are learning how to control the consciousness. Learning how to direct attention. Learning how to pay attention. Learning how to work with the mind. The battlefield is your own mind. It is your own heart. It is your own life. It's not outside of you. The battlefield is inside. The enemy is your own self, but the false self. Your allies are your own self, but the real self. And to know how to tell the difference requires a lot of practice. In order to receive the forces of Kap through Neshima, we have to learn how to meditate. This is the most important skill the warrior has to acquire. By meditation, I'm not referring to mere concentration. Concentration practice is like a basic exercise that a warrior would do, such as drilling with a weapon, swinging the sword over and over in certain positions, certain postures using the spear in a certain way over and over and over in order to learn how it feels in the hand, how to manage the weight of it, the balance of it. This is concentration practice. It's necessary. It is not meditation. It is not the battlefield itself. In all, throughout all the exercises, the warrior has to be vigilant. Without vigilance, the battle is lost already. The vigilance of the warrior is the ability to control attention from moment to moment. The ability to remain in a state of observation of oneself. This is a profoundly difficult thing to learn. The intellect says, oh yeah, I get that. Awareness, sure, I've heard of that before. Mindfulness, right. Yeah, I know what that is. I can do that. That's not it. The force of mindfulness is the force of persuasion. The force of attention is the force of persuasion, is the force of the Arcanum 11. To be in a state of self-observation is to be that goddess who's gently closing the jaws of the lion with great attention and great serenity. This is why the Buddha is the lion of the Shakya clan. The Buddha represents our own inner Buddha, our own Atman, our own inner self. The Buddha himself 
The term Buddha means awakened one. To be awake means to be attentive, to pay attention, to be aware, to observe. This is not a thought. Neither is it an attitude. It is a way of perceiving. And it is an activity that has to be constantly managed. In the beginning, the student who's training to become a warrior hears about mindfulness, about attention, about self-observation. And they learn certain exercises in order to control and direct attention. And they feel and assume that it is like taking an object and setting it down. Here is my attention. Now I know it's there. And then they forget. It's not that simple. When you place your attention, this is good to consciously place attention, to consciously observe. But this has to be continual. To be done once is only the beginning. We have to continually and constantly manage the presence of the consciousness. What you'll notice is if you accomplish that, you feel something. Something feels different. When you really become aware and pay attention, something feels different. And in the beginning, this can feel really uncomfortable, really different, strange. In fact, it can start to feel very uncomfortable. And we want to go back to our dreaming life and abandon the observation. And this is generally what we do. We maintain the observation for brief periods, and then we forget. And we return to our process of dreaming and thinking and fantasizing and imagining and being lost. Self-observation is the most important training the warrior undergoes. It is the basis of being effective in the battle. You can only meditate if you know how to self-observe. If you do not know how to observe yourself, you cannot meditate. Meditation is an extension of self-observation. It is the very same act, just deeper. Self-observation is the foundation of all work with the mind. Durga takes that snake, the serpent, to battle the demon who forms himself into a lion. How does she kill him? How does she conquer him? She can only do it when we see his form. When we see him for what he is. You see, Durga is riding a lion, battling a lion. If we don't see the distinction in ourselves between the positive forces and the negative forces within our own psyche, then how can we eliminate that which is impure? How can we change our behavior for the better if we can't tell the difference between what is good and what is bad? This is particularly interesting when we realize in our own lives we can hardly make a decision about where to go from one day to the next, about what to do from one day to the next. 
because we can't tell what is right and what is wrong. If we lack that discrimination in such superficial things, how will we have the discrimination to tell the difference between very deep aspects of our psyche? We develop that. We develop it through self-observation, through meditation. When the consciousness is harnessed in this way, when we make the effort to be present, to observe, we feel something different. It can feel uncomfortable. We can feel awkward, exposed, like we don't feel like ourselves. And this is good. This is important. We have to maintain it, continue it. That pressure, that energy, we feel it inside. There's something that you feel in yourself that feels different. What is that? The pressure of the consciousness is the force of persuasion. Learning how to direct attention while remembering the being, while remembering God, properly activates and utilizes that force. To observe oneself is critical. It's the basis. But if one does not remember the being, you can fall into mistakes. You see, in black magic, they also learn to observe. In black magic, you also learn to meditate. You learn to concentrate. You learn to learn things about your, your mind and work on your psyche. How do you know the difference between black and white? Between working on yourself in the right way and working on yourself in the wrong way? Who can provide that? Obviously, your own being is the only one. But your being can only do that if you remember your being. Self-observation is incomplete if we also forget we are a child of God. We have to be humble to remember our being. This is what allows the force of our own inner divinity, our own inner Buddha, the lion, to influence us, to provide us with guidance, hunches, feelings, a sense about it. Even if we don't have reason, we know. This is the force of cop, which comes through the pineal gland. comes through the pituitary gland, comes through the atom noose, comes through the spinal column, through the heart. The deeper our self-observation becomes, the more profound our self-remembering becomes, the more influence the being has to give us guidance. The more we forget our being, the more we are distracted, the more we fantasize and daydream, the less the being can help. When we as a warrior train to learn self-observation, to learn self-remembering, to learn meditation, we're training the consciousness. We're training our own essence in order to perceive properly, to perceive all phenomena, all impressions, inside and outside. This is a great battle. In the process of doing so, 
The only way to gather more attention, more awareness, is to steal it from the cages it's trapped within, which are the egos themselves. But to conquer an ego is not done with violence. It is not done with being very forceful. For example, you may observe in yourself the tendency to become irritated with a certain person. And if you forcibly suppress that, you only hide it from yourself. That's all. In the same way, if you notice an ego of lust that arises and you pray and pray to be free of it, but you don't look at it, you're only avoiding it. The force of persuasion is the ability to look directly into the eyes of the hungry lion with absolute serenity and with the force of your own will to close its mouth so it cannot feed itself anymore on you. Because that's what's happening. The ego is consuming our very soul. The ego desire, lust, pride, anger, fear, has already consumed 97% of our essence. That's why we're in such darkness. That's why humanity is suffering so much. That's why there's so much pain. But we cannot conquer that with itself. You cannot conquer violence with violence. The violence of the ego cannot be conquered with more violence. It is conquered with force, yes. But the force of ka, the force of persuasion, which is the force of serenity. The force of comprehension, of understanding. The Master Samael on Vior states beautifully, That sweetness, kindness, is a more crushing force than anger. And it's absolutely true. We don't know that because we don't know how to do it. When someone's angry with us, we respond with anger. When someone's violent with us, we respond with violence. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And then everyone is blind and maimed and wounded. The Master Jesus embodied the force of persuasion. He confronted violence with kindness, with love. The Buddha himself conquered violence with the force of persuasion. Krishna as well. But this has to be understood in context of our own psychological work. The ego is not conquered by suppression. When we see an ego of anger, of lust, of fear, we don't conquer it by being violent with it, by rejecting it, by being forceful, by suppressing. It may be necessary sometimes in order to keep it from doing too much damage to us. But to fully conquer it is acquired by comprehending it, by looking at it, by seeing all its details. You can't do that if your heart is agitated, if your mind is agitated. This is a process of meditation, and it requires a lot of patience, a lot of persistence. It's not overnight. Comprehension comes gradual. In the same way that you grow a tree, comprehension is born in us. Some students of varying mystical traditions wholeheartedly embrace 
the intention of walking the path and become very inspired, meditate a lot, teach, preach, and write in a very strong and forceful manner. If we're not careful, we can take that influence but become fanatic. We can become very harmful to ourselves and to others. Because we're 97% trapped in the ego. We can take those forces and invert them and make them harmful. That lion, which is the lion of Judah, the lion of the initiates, can get out of control and can build pride and vanity. Which can, of course, in the end, stifle what originally were good intentions. So, to discriminate, we have to know how to always question ourselves, to observe ourselves. We have to know how to rely on the guidance of the being, not the guidance of our mind. In the Egyptian mysteries, once again, there's a story. Mankind, at one time, believe it or not, was out of control. And was producing a great offense to the solar father, Amun-Ra. So Amun-Ra calls together the primary gods, including Shu and Tefnut. And he said, something has to be done. Humanity is out of control with their blasphemy. Shu and Tefnut recommend sending their daughter, Hathor. Because Hathor, while well known as a cow goddess, also a lion goddess, and also represented with this circle with horns, has a wrathful aspect, known as the Eye of Ra. So they turned her loose on humanity. And she became like Durga, or Kali, went on a rampage, killing all of mankind. And after some time of this violence, of punishment, Ra said, it's time to end this. In this story, we see how forces can be positive, negative, creative, destructive, persuasion in different forms. What's important for us to realize is that we ourselves have an influence in how that energy is channeled by dint of will. We have to comprehend that the forces which we receive and utilize carry with them a great responsibility. This story illustrates the subtleties of working with these forces, the dangers that exist in our own psyche. How do we do it? There's another story which beautifully illustrates this. Of course, in... Um, in uh, Buddhism, we know that the Buddha is known as the Lion of the Shakya, 
But the teachings themselves, the Dharma, is known as the lion's roar. But again, this lion, the roar of the lion, to study and understand the teaching is only one part of our puzzle. We have to understand that. We have to learn to hear the roar of the lion, which is our own innermost, who's giving us the doctrine, the teaching, through self-observation, self-remembering, and meditation. But there are subtleties, there are difficulties in learning how to perceive what's within us. One student of that initiate Milarepa came to Milarepa and said, when I meditate on the ocean, my mind is very comfortable. When I meditate on the waves, my mind is troubled. Tell me how to meditate on the waves. We first have to understand what this means. When we meditate, when we enter real meditation, we understand that the mind itself is an ocean. And the natural state of the mind is to be a perfect reflective surface. The natural state of the mind is a state of perfect equanimity and serenity within which the universe is reflected. This is what's normal. But when impressions of life enter into us and we react with that animal nature, with pride, with fear, with envy, the waters are disturbed. The waters of our own mind become agitated. We experience this now because our mind is like a sea, very chaotic very uncomfortable, and we're seasick most of the time, disoriented, nauseous, confused. It takes practice and work to reach a state of being in balance, of being serene. So those waves of the ocean are produced by the ego, by the I. So the student was saying, when I meditate on the absolute nature of mind, I have serenity. Meaning the student could enter a state of shamatha, or a state of pratyahara, to have a serene mind. Yet, when the student tried to meditate on the impressions that come from the ego, the rolling mind itself, the reactions, the student is confused. The student is asking this question, how do I meditate on the reactions that are produced in my heart and mind. Milarepa gives a beautiful answer. He says, the waves are the movement of the ocean. Leave them to subside by themselves in its vastness. Thoughts are the play of pure awareness. They arise within it and dissolve back into it. To recognize pure awareness is where your thoughts come from, is to recognize that your thoughts have never come into existence, remained, or ceased. At that point, thoughts can no longer trouble your mind. When you run after your thoughts, you are like a dog chasing a stick. Every time a stick is thrown, you run after it. But if instead... You look at where your thoughts are coming from. You will see that it, each thought arises and dissolves within the space of that awareness without engendering other thoughts. Be like a lion who, rather than chasing after the stick, turns to face the thrower. You can only throw a stick at a lion once. beautiful. This is the force of persuasion. To be like a lion, a lion of the Dharma. We become that lion of the Dharma when we close the jaws of our own animal nature. And when we do that, 
In actual fact, when we stop the ego in us from feeding itself, we receive a crown. The crown of Kaf. The crown of Keter. The crown of the cosmic Christ. The crown of gold. In the book of Revelation it says, To he that overcometh, I will give a crown of life. Meaning, we have to overcome ourselves. We have to conquer the ego. We have to conquer our own subjective psyche. Again, this is not done with mere intention, with taking a vow, or with meaning well. It has to be done in facts. You have to test yourself. You have to observe yourself. How do you know when an ego is dead? When the reactions it once produced no longer arise. That's how you know. If you still see in yourself pride, anger, lust, fear, self-esteem, self-hate, you still have ego. If you see in yourself anxiety, worry, distress, you still have ego. The force of persuasion is accompanied with serenity, with joy in the heart, which is spontaneous, which arises on its own. This is not artificial. Any questions? Right. But, I mean, to force people to mind to be silent, say in your workplace, wherever you are, you can, obviously you can meditate, you know, you can. Why not, you know, say to mind be silent, you know? I don't want this thought to enter my mind right now. Okay. I've the, done it many times. the question is can you tell the mind to be silent in a forceful way? Yeah, you can. In fact, we have those instructions in our tradition to command the mind. This is good, and sometimes it's necessary, but it has to be understood in its right context. To forcefully command the mind is necessary from time to time, in the same way when a child misbehaves. Sometimes you have to be forceful. But to raise the child properly, you have to treat it with love. Right? You have to have the authority of a parent, but also the love of a parent. This is something that the consciousness is capable of to be forceful in proper balance, in proper measure. Unfortunately, though, some schools and some students adopt the approach of being forceful continually. This is tyranny. And that kind of tyranny can be applied against our own mind, which is harmful. As an example, we state, certain schools of meditation teach only that. To dominate, 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 dominate the mind. Forceful, forceful, forceful. This is harmful. It actually produces harm. To reach the state of serenity or mental equilibrium requires to let go to relax, to rest, to be in a state of repose. And being forceful like that all the time is antithetical. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Any other questions? You get that continuality of let it be silent, you know. I mean, I've worked at full point for okay, a second, you know. Then it continues to a minute. Then it continues for five minutes. Okay. So you're saying you just... Right. The question is about achieving silence, right? 
con- continual silence. Again, we have to look at our point of view, our intention. Yes, we seek to achieve the silence of the mind. But understand, the silence of the mind is its natural state. If you leave the mind alone, it will settle. If you force the mind, meaning you're constantly pushing pressure against it, you disturb it. You grasp what I'm saying? If you're constantly being forceful, then you are pushing against that and creating a reaction which is not going to allow the mind to settle at all. The force is applied by maintaining continual attention. Right? And Milarepa gave the beautiful explanation of how that works. Normally, we're looking at the thoughts and chasing them and being forceful. This thought, you need to settle down, and this thought, you need to settle down, and running around in our meditation. This is wrong. It's the wrong approach. The right approach is to stay in one place and turn and see where the thought came from. Just observing. Just watching. In that way, there is force, but it's the force of controlling attention. It's not a force to stop something from happening. Right? That's the proper approach to meditation. And in fact, it applies to self-observation too. Through the day, during the day, at all times, we observe. Don't become forceful with your mind. Don't demand it. Demand instead of yourself to maintain awareness and to watch the thoughts that arise and watch the feelings that arise and watch the sensations that arise. That continual watchfulness is what produces the state of calm that you want. A state of silence cannot be forced. It's impossible. The state of calm is already natural to your mind. And it's arrived at when those forces of the ego and impressions stop hitting the mind in a violent way. But if you're violent in your approach, the violence in the mind will be sustained. And that chaos will always be there. Instead... Use the force of persuasion to direct attention. Be continually mindful and observant, remembering your being. This is what pulls those solar forces into the psyche, which provide a great deal of food and energy for the consciousness to keep doing it. Okay, another question? When a lustful image is in our presence... Instead of avoiding the image, one should look it in the eyes of the lion and observe and remember ourselves and see what happens. What is or is not felt and thought? I'm not sure I understand the question. What is or is not felt? Yeah, you confront it face to face. That lustful impression. Yeah. When you observe an impression, you observe it. That's simply it. I'm not sure I understand. You observe your feelings and thoughts. That's the extent of it. I'm not sure I see where that question is going. Yeah. You, you, in, in all cases, in the face of any impression, you just observe it. That's all. You observe. You watch. Now, when there's a strong impression, we have to be careful. Particularly if we notice that the mind is becoming identified. This is when we have to learn to control impressions. For example, it is not wise for a beginning student to watch pornography, to look at very harmful imagery like violence because the mind will become identified and you will create problems for yourself. This is like sending a child into the midst of a great battle. 
the child would get killed. Only a seasoned warrior can deal with certain kinds of impressions. You should not seek out harmful impressions. Merely deal with what's before you. Let your being bring you what you need. Because he will. This is the job of our own trainer. Part of our psyche, which is already in us, to give us what we need to work on. Don't seek it out. Let it come. Let life bring you what you need to work on, and you will get what you need. I state it this way because there are certain traditions which seek out intense impressions, and they do damage to themselves. It's very sad. They seek out intense impressions purposefully. And unfortunately, they have the the pride and arrogance to believe that they can transform those things. But what's actually happening is they're doing harm to themselves. We should not follow that example. We should follow the example of the great masters. Receive the impressions that are coming to you already. Transform those. Learn how to manage impressions. For example, if you find yourself facing an impression which is too intense, turn away. Don't go to places where you know you'll have bad impressions. For example, if you have friends who are engaged in activities which are harmful to you or others, don't go. This is not suppression. This is intelligence. We have to be smart. Don't put yourself in a place where you will get hurt. It's simple. If it's unavoidable, then there's nothing you can do, right? You have to deal with it. But in most cases, it is avoidable. What we state is unavoidable is usually because pride is interfering. Like, for example, you have a family event, and everybody assumes you, you, you have to go to this family event. You have to. It's family. No, you don't. Your pride says you have to. And your fear of your family rejecting you or criticizing you says you have to. That's ego. The only thing that should determine what you do and do not do is your consciousness your being, your intuition. Yeah, I don't know your family, but let me tell you. It's true. In many cases, we have to stand up to these types of things and define ourselves and say no. Another question? Yes. Right, the lion posture is a is a ancient posture related to dream yoga and meditation. Yeah, it's related to the Dharma, to receiving those forces related to Leo, related to the Buddha. Yeah. That's simply it. <laughs> Another question? I should explain a little bit about the relationship between Kaf and Bet. As you see they look very similar. Kaf has this form of a hand grasping. And if we just extend the base a little bit, we have the letter bet. And of course, bet is related to the arcanum two, which is the house. Bet is related to the Divine Mother. In bet, you'll remember we were discussing duality discussing the mother, and discussing the house, in other words, the soul, the house of God, the soul we have to build. So Bet has those correspondences. Kaf is the force of the Divine Mother. Kaf is the force channeled through that house. That's the relationship. Kaf is the force of persuasion, or the force of of the Divine Mother, that Divine Feminine, which can be used to conquer the ego. Any questions? Yes. Um, perhaps you can explain the symbolism of the serpent or snake that's shown um, with legs. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the serpent at the bottom of the card, which appears in the cube, is an ancient Egyptian symbol. Uh, I've seen some different names for that serpent. In one case, it was called Sito. I'm not sure of the exact name. But the, that ancient symbol in Egyptian mysteries is a serpent that encircles the world, which we talked about in previous lectures. Oh, right. The serpent in the beginning was said to have legs, right? Legs and arms in Genesis. Right. It's true. It'd be the same thing, the same symbol. It's that ancient serpent in the beginning related to the formation of things, which in, in its turn becomes negative, becomes tempting. Right? What's the significance of the legs or the absence of As far as I know, the legs signify... Uh, I don't want to speculate about it. There's, there's some contradictory things that I'm not entirely sure about. The point of it is that in this graphic we see Horus standing on the back of the serpent. And this is a symbol of the Christ conquering that serpent and controlling it. Directing that serpent through will. And that's what we have to do in order to perfect the stone, which is the cube around it. The, the falcon is also carrying a flail. A flail is a, a tool that you use to harvest wheat. It's a long stick with some pieces that come out on the end, and you use it to swing it to harvest wheat. And of course, wheat is a symbol of the sexual seed, like rice and corn and other traditions. So the Christ uses the flail to harvest the seeds in the same way that Jesus talked about the sower, sowing seeds and then harvesting, which is related to the 13th Arcanum, which we'll come to very soon. And you see in the 13th Arcanum, the guy harvesting the wheat. So it's related to that. Any other questions? Oh, I forgot one thing. On the head of the woman in the card, we see the symbol of infinity. We see a serpent, and we see a vulture, or a bird. All of these indicate mastery and the incarnation of Keter. Because you know the, the symbol of the infinite is on the first arcanum, card number one. So this card of number 11 is obviously closely related to number one and two. Yes? Yes. Okay. You mean something in my memory bank, and I don't know if you mean to remember something that's said of who I am. Okay, very good. The question is about what does self-remembering mean in practical terms, especially in meditation. Self-remembering is simply the remembrance of yourself, your being. To be aware that you are a child of your own being. To remember that. To just remember that, to have that in your awareness, in this moment, to realize what you are in, in terms of what's pure in you, what's genuine in you, comes from Him, comes from God, your being, your source, your spark. When you say remember, does that mean that I know it and I've forgotten it and I'm looking for something that... It, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. Okay, it simply means to be to be aware of it. It's sort of like an inquiry or a prayer. You're just opening yourself and, and trying to remain aware of that divinity. Right now, we don't directly perceive it because we're in darkness. But with that application, being observant of oneself first, but also being aware that we are not alone to reach out with one's heart, with one's awareness, to try to perceive one's being. That's simply all it is. To be in a state of self-remembering is to reach out with the heart in continual prayer. To always be trying to feel the presence of God in everything, all around oneself and within oneself. In a sense, you can say that self-observation and self-remembering are a kind of dance 
that you do with your awareness. You're always observing external phenomena. You're always observing internal phenomena. In other words, states inside, events outside. But at the same time, wrapped around that is the awareness that we come from God. That I in myself have my own inner father. And in myself, I have my own inner mother. And I don't feel them all the time because I walked away from them. Because I've entered into mistakes. But with that continual observation, internal and external, and the reaching out with one's heart to feel the presence of God, you do start to feel it. Right. The remembrance is not so much with the mind, although you can use the mind as a tool. The, the intellect that we have is a tool. The heart, the emotional center, is also a tool, just the same way the body is. You can generate remembrance of God by using those three brains. But the actual remembrance is conscious. I'll give you an example. Japa is a Sanskrit word which refers to the practice of using mala beads. In Catholicism, you have the same tradition. In Buddhism, you have the same tradition. Practitioners take a string of beads like this one. They hold it in the hand, different ways of holding it. But you use the physical body, motor instinctive sexual brain, to hold the beads. And you say a mantra with your heart and mind. And the mantra is to pray and remember God. You say the mantra, and then you turn one bead. You say the mantra, you turn a bead, you say the mantra. Of course, now you watch practitioners of this doing it very fast, trying to do as many mantras as they can as quickly as they can. This is not the way to do the practice. The way to practice this is to develop profound attention and remembrance of God or awareness of God. This is how you integrate the three brains, right? This is an exercise. It is a practice to develop continuity of awareness, and that's it. In the, some people, at their own stage of work, this is their religion, to do this type of practice, japa, to just be doing their mantra in all things and all times, walking with their, their beads, doing the mantra. And it's fine, it's good for them, but it has to be abandoned. This is like what the exercises you do in kindergarten when you're practicing your letters. Eventually, you have to start writing words, writing sentences, and writing books. You don't do that with japa. You do that with continual self-observation and self-remembering, which is done in all things, in all times, without the artifice of the beads. It's done as a continual effort in oneself. Does that make sense? Sure. Will? Yeah. What is will within that? Within the self observation okay. and Right. In this sense, will is how you direct your energy. Simply that. Will means choosing the direction for one's action. So it is a decision. It's a decision, yes, but it is not limited to the intellect. We tend to think of a decision as a thought process where we say, oh, well, there's this and then that and then I'll do that. It's not as simple as that. Will is pure action or the, the direction of action. You do things by will without thought. For example, someone makes you really angry and you hit them without thinking. There's will there, will to hurt, a will to violence. So will is how the consciousness is directed. And that's why it's so important. Will, in us, 
is 97% trapped in ego. Which means the majority of our energies have the inclination to behave in the wrong way. Have been focused in that way already. We have 3% left, more or less 3%. So that's David and Goliath. Right? David is that small force of that 3%. But if David in us, our consciousness, our essence, remembers God, then he has a big advantage. He then has the capacity to overcome Goliath if he remembers God. But if he does not, the ego will consume him. So that's the battle we face in ourselves. We have to train David. But how is that will during the meditation and the self-remembering not a function of the ego? I don't know how to make that will not a function of my ego. Great question. How, does that, how do we make that will not a function of the ego, to free it from ego? By discrimination. This is a process that we have to pass through, learning about ourselves. In, from moment to moment, we are processing energy. That is, we are a transformer of forces, the forces of kat, right? As those energies are processing through us, we have our psyche, which receives it. We have our nervous systems, which transform it. We have our chakras. We have our bodies. We have the three brains. All of this is interrelated with how those forces are used. Normally, or abnormally, we would say, all those forces are being utilized by the ego, directing those energies to feed our pride, to support our pride, to feed our anger, to support our anger, to feed our lust. That is the lion itself. The lion is that will of the animal nature. When we meditate, when we observe ourselves, we have to separate from that. Extremely important to understand what that means. To observe properly, to remember oneself in the right way, we have to distinguish between the will or desire of the ego and the will or intention of the consciousness. Will, in its pure form, is consciousness itself. But when it's entered into us, in our psyche, and is trapped in the, in, in the ego, it is desire. And that desire is always related to sensation. Sensation physically, emotionally, and in the mind. So when we meditate, we observe all phenomena. And the basis of that observation is to learn, how is will functioning in me right now? And you'll see... Well, I have this desire to get up because my, knit, my legs hurt. Or I have this desire to go watch TV because my show is coming on. That's will trapped in ego, trapped in desire. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it's just confusing when your will says, I want to be a better person. But yeah. I know that can be will. And sure. That, that's when it gets hard. It gets very difficult to distinguish between the different forms of will. Right. When it says, I want to meditate, but it's not, I mean, it's not void of ego. The, the answer to this question is only resolved when you've completed the work of self-realization. That work to self-realize is to unify all of the aspects of the being into one. And that has stages. In the beginning, we have a lot of consciousness trapped in the ego. So we have many discursive wills. We have wills of pride that are opposed to other wills of pride that are opposed to the will of the being. Many different contradictory wills or desires, in other words. So the first stage, kill the ego. Extract all the consciousness from all those egos. But that's only the first part. Because then you become free of the ego, but you still have a being of many parts, which has to be integrated into one will. So the work with will or the work with consciousness is a long road. Telema. That's why we say telema, willpower. The power of the will, but it's the power of the being to conquer. 
And that's the magician, Arcanum I. Any other questions? Good. See you next week. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,